You know, I've thought and prayed about this lesson a long time. We're beginning a series today about worship, and I realize that true worship really only comes from true worshipers. So I want you to think today and ask you this question, are you a true worshiper? I want to think about what worship really is in Scripture. Worship, in my view, is a personal, spiritual intimacy with God. It's when I personally become intimate with God and connect with God in an intimate way. Let me try to explain that by asking you this. What are some of the best conversations that you've ever had with another person in your entire life that you can reflect back on and think of a conversation where you just connected with another person on the deepest level possible? If you can think of a conversation that you had like that, I'm betting that it was when your spirit, your soul, made a connection with the spirit or soul of another person There had to be a lot of openness there on both parties' part. There had to be some honesty in that conversation, if it was really a good conversation. There were probably deep feelings shared in that conversation. You had to lower the barriers down in order to have that kind of a conversation. Uh, You had to be vulnerable to have that kind of a conversation, right or wrong. But if those things are all true, we can, we can understand those things when we're relating in a very humble, open, vulnerable way with another person. But can you see that that's really what worship is when we come before God in that same frame of mind? In John 4, verse 23, to a woman whose life was totally out of sync with God, Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, John 4, 23, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, there are those moments when my spirit, my soul, the inner being, me, on my inside, lines myself up with God, with God's spirit. And for a moment, there's true conversation, there's true communication, there's true intimacy between us. Mary once sang these words, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Um, In the Psalms, the psalmist said, unto you, O Lord, do I what? Lift up my soul. See, when I lift up my soul to the Spirit of God, when the true spiritual insides of me come face to face with the Spirit of the Creator, That's worship. And I know we do things over and over again. We have our rites, our I-T-E. We have our rituals. We have our repetition. We come every Lord's Day to the same place. Uh, We do the same kind of singing and the same kind of praying and the same kind of Lord's Supper and the same kind of giving. And we repeat all those things. Sing, pray, Lord's Supper, give over and over and over. Sometimes when we come here, we simply observe It's sort of like we're spectators. We watch everything that happens, and we observe all of that. Observation is not worship. Sometimes we come, and we simply listen. We listen to other people. We think it sounds pretty, but just listening is not worship. Sometimes, if we're quite honest with ourselves, and I'm looking back at some of y'all, and I know that you simply endure. You say, when's that old man going to shut up so I can go eat, you know? We simply endure. We're like when I was a little kid, we'd say, Mom, when's he going to be done? When's he going to be quiet? When can we leave? You know, we endure. That's not worship. Sometimes we mouth words. Like we sing songs like we did before. We might mouth, here I am to worship. But are you, I'm talking about you, are you here to worship? Sometimes we actually participate. Our soul joins in. And spirit to spirit, we become open, we become honest, we become vulnerable, we become people who worship God. Worship is a human being connecting with God on a personal level 
so that God is pleased and a relationship with God is strengthened. That's what worship is. What is worship? Well, if you're filling in your little blanks, true worship is bringing a gift to God. What have you brought to God today? You know, I'm a poor gift giver. I realize that. But you know, when you really give a gift to somebody, and I think Keith said this well a moment ago, you're giving that gift to please somebody, to make somebody happy. You're giving that gift to say something to somebody. You know, what are you trying to say as you give this gift? You're giving that gift, whatever it is, to convey your feelings about another person. Now, I know sometimes it's, oh, you know, little Johnny's got a birthday party, and have we got him a gift yet? And yeah, we got to get him a gift, and, and we get him a gift, and you're smiling because we know that's the way it is, and we give it, but we're not really thinking very much about expressing our deep feeling to little Johnny. Maybe some of you are, but a lot of people, they're just getting a gift. Or maybe somebody has a shower, and we say, oh, you know, we got to get a shower gift, and you go get a shower gift, and maybe we're not really expressing a deep feeling. Maybe sometimes you are if that couple is very personable to you. You know, when Jacob gave Joseph the coat of many colors, and all the other boys were jealous, and the dad gave that son to them a very special gift, his dad was saying something to him. His dad was saying, you're special. His dad was saying, I love you. His dad was was saying, you're the apple of my eye. That's what he was saying. He was saying that with that gift. In uh, John chapter 12, Mary, the, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, she goes in before Jesus and she breaks this alabaster jar of myrrh, nard ointment that was very expensive. In fact, it was worth almost a year's wages. And she breaks this thing and she pours it on his feet and the house is filled with the perfume. And Judas, who was a thief, almost had a heart attack. And he said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? This thing could have been sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. And you've just wasted, you've poured it all on his feet or half of it. It's terrible. But what was Mary Magdalene saying? in her heart, from her heart, about how she felt about Jesus. When she poured that on his feet, she was saying something deep. She was saying something powerful. She was saying something personal when she did that about Jesus. Abel in Hebrews 11:4. by faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. And the Bible says, God bearing witness in respect of his gifts. What was he saying? What was Abel saying? He was saying, I respect you, creator. He was saying, I submit myself to you, mighty God. He was saying, I'm thankful to you, Lord. He was saying something with those gifts that he brought. And Noah, when he came out of the ark in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 and 21, and he took of those clean animals and he offered, and the Bible says the Hebrew word olah means he sent up in smoke a gift to God, and it says that God smelled the aroma. Nasty burning flesh. Oh, yum. No, God smelled the aroma of those gifts. And what was, what was Noah giving that smelled so good to God? I think God smelled true gratitude going up in that smoke. I think God smelled true obedience and submission going up in that smoke. I think uh, Noah was sending up true commitment to the God who had saved him in that smoke and true humility before the Lord and God said that smells good there was a connection there it was a gift given there was praise offered there was gratitude offered there was a penitent heart offered there was a humble spirit offered there was an offering of love giving money should be an offering of love now you know you get into somebody's pocketbook you're getting personal right If you really get into somebody's pocketbook, you're getting really personal. When we give, I know we kind of gloss over it as a matter of worship, but when we really give to God, we're giving a gift to our Creator, and we're saying something, church, to Him. We're saying something in that gift. I love you. 
We're saying you mean everything to me. We're saying you're important to me. We're saying your will and your work is way up there. It's the top of my list. We're saying that from our hearts, from our spirit to God. And when we give saying something like that, God can read it. And it's our soul being lifted up to God. And God is saying, ah, that smells good. Unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. What are you lifting up to God today? Unto thee, O Lord, Unto do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Oh, my God, I trust in Thee. Oh, let me not be ashamed, but not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on Thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait. But not my enemies triumph over me. <clears throat> and when I made this lesson, I had a picture of a little boy that's now been replaced by that wonderful stick man right there. And uh, this little boy had a really needy, uh, worried expression on his face, and he had his little telephone, and he was trying to call his mother. This little boy really wanted to call his mother. Uh, from reading my scriptures in the Old Testament to the New, I've realized that worship is a true calling out of our soul to the Lord. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, after the whole Cain and Abel thing when Cain killed Abel and then Cain was banished and then it says they had another son and his name was Seth and it says then men became, uh, came to call upon the name of the Lord. They began to call upon the name of the Lord. They began to cry out to God. They began to seek God. Remember when you were little and you said, Mom, Mom, da hey, Dad, Dad. And you cried out to your parents, and you needed your parents <clears throat> to answer you, <clears throat> and you needed to hear them and connect with them, and you needed to be received by them. In Genesis 12, 8, the Bible says that Abraham went to this place between Bethel and Ahai, and he built an altar there, and it says there he called upon the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Folks... I know that the Bible teaches that our life is a sacrifice to God. I get that. But will you please listen? Throughout Scripture, theologically, from the Old Testament to the New, what we mean by worship is a specific thing that takes place at a specific th time and a specific place. Notice Genesis 12, verse 8. There, in that spot, he built an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. In Genesis 21, verse 33, in Beersheba, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. A little bit later in Genesis 26, 25, Isaac, his son, came to Beersheba and built an altar, and it says there, in that place, at that moment, at that time, he called upon the name of the everlasting God. Just like the little boy went to the office and he was upset, and he got the phone, and at that moment, at time, at that place, he picked up that phone and he dialed that, and there, in that moment, he reached out and called to his mother. Worship is when in a particular place, at a particular moment, we decide that we, from our soul to God's, are going to call out to our maker, and we're going to try to get to our maker and get his attention in a good way. 
Paul wrote to young Timothy, flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, purity, along with all those that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. When that little boy was calling his mother, he was calling to her from his heart. And when we call on the name of the Lord, we need to call on the Lord out of a pure heart, out of a sincere heart. We sing this song, create in me a clean heart, O God. But this morning, if you've been calling to God sincerely, openly, honestly, without reservation, without hiding, you're calling on him out of a pure heart. The psalmist talks about kingdoms who do not call upon the name of the Lord. And there are many people here in our city and in our country who do not call upon the name of the Lord. In Psalm 18, verse 6, the Bible says, In my distress I called upon you, Lord. And I cried to God for help, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came to his ears. Sometimes I call out to God in desperation, and I want my cry to come to his ears. Now, when someone calls here, or when someone calls you at your business, I have an idea that uh, it depends on who calls at some times. And if certain people call, uh, you'll tell your secretary or whatever, and eh, not now. I don't want to talk to that person. Please, I don't want to talk to them right now. Or maybe if there's a certain person who's irritated you over stuff forever and you don't want to talk to them, you'll say, you know, don't take calls from that person anymore. I know that doesn't happen with any of y'all, but I'm pretty sure it does. Don't take calls from that person anymore. And then there are some people that call, especially my sweetheart, if she calls, I say, It doesn't matter what I'm doing or who I'm with or what's going on. If she calls, you interrupt me, and I will talk to her, see? Now, that's the kind of person I want to be with God. I don't want to be when I call out to my father with tears. I don't want him to say, well, I'm not taking calls from him. I want him to say, no matter what I'm doing, interrupt me, because I want to hear from him when he calls, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. My one request, my righteousness, oh God, how I need thee. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cries. Listen. But the face of the Lord is turned against those who do evil. Be gracious unto me, O Lord, for to you I call out all day long. Those who call upon the name of the Lord in worship, those who come to a place like this, those who fall down at their bedside and call upon the name of the Lord out of a pure heart, those who uh, in the morning in the car turn off the radio and cry out to God from a pure heart, those who come to a place like this and instead of just just halfway uh, listening to the person that's leading the prayer, when the heads are bowed, you cry out to your God. Those are the people who are worshiping. They're calling on the name of the Lord. You know, the call of a spirit. I'm not talking about the call of a voice. Listen to me. I'm talking about when the spirit of a person, when the guts of a person, when the soul of a person cries out to the spirit of God. That's worship. From the depths of my soul, I cry out. Let's stand as we sing this together. From the depths of my soul I cry out, from the depths of my soul I cry out, Lord can you hear me, have mercy on me, from the depths of my soul I cry out, in the midst of the sea I cry out. In the midst of the sea I cry out, save me the water is over my head. <clears throat> In the midst of the sea I cry In the midst. out, there is a time to mourn, there is a time to weep, there 
From the depths of my soul I cry out, from the depths of my soul I cry out, still I will praise you, Lord, still I will praise you, Lord. You see the As I've read my Bible over the years, I've discovered that worship, true worship, is a journey. <clears throat> worship is a journey of my spirit to meet with the Spirit of God. Where are you today? Where have you been today? Where are you going today? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I come to the garden alone. <clears throat> Do you? <clears throat> I can picture Jesus, you know, thinking, <clears throat> pardon me, that he needed to go pray. I can picture him going out, <clears throat> pardon me, the sheep gate of Jerusalem and going down through the Kidron Valley and going up to that garden and longing to be in that garden because he just wanted to be by himself with the Lord. I come to the garden alone. <clears throat> the journey to come and meet with God is a journey from being a taker to being a giver. It is a spiritual journey from being in rebellion to being in humble submission. It is a spiritual journey from the land of denial to the land of openness and honesty. It is a spiritual journey from ignoring your creator to seeking your creator. It is a spiritual journey between being close to God and being open to God. In Psalm 84, the psalmist is talking about a journey, an actual journey of somebody who wanted to go meet God. Psalm 84, verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. See, that's what worship is. It's a pilgrimage to wherever you are in the world and in all your thoughts and in all your craziness and in, in all your worldly pursuits, a pilgrimage. It's leaving that place and passing through whatever valleys you've got to pass through to get to God. They pass through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They, these pilgrims, go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. Church, church, like we're doing this morning, is not worship. That is, being here is not worship. Let me say it a different way. The assembly is not worship. It's not worship unless you, you personally, Make the journey spiritually from wherever you were and wherever you have been to come into the gates of God and come before your God in Zion. You know, we sing this song, and it's a beautiful song. The Lord is in his holy temple. 
Well, he is. And he always has been. But you have to go meet him there. You have to bring your spirit before his spirit. In Psalm 43, this captive that was captive in Babylon said, Let them bring me to your holy mountain, the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God. Worship does not equal the assembly. Worship is when you, in your heart and your mind, resolve that no matter what else happens in the gathering of people, you yourself will come before the Lord God, and you yourself will bow down to him, and you yourself will enter his presence and seek him with a humble and open heart. We sing this old song. It's so beautiful. But I want you to feel the words of it right now. Lord, we come before you now. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. As you read the Bible from, from Cain to the book of Revelation and Abel to the book of Revelation, worship is obedience, it's humility, it's submission to God. Oh, but God, I want to argue with you a little bit. Surely you don't mean that. Oh, oh Lord, uh, I, I, wanna, I, I can't go that far. Uh, oh, Lord, you know... And we justify what we're doing. And, oh, Lord, I, I don't want to be honest with this. See, true worship always everywhere in the Bible is obedience. Cain was proud. True worship does not occur through pride. A, pride spirit, a prideful spirit is not aligned with God. It's only a humble spirit that connects with the spirit of God. When Cain brought his sacrifice, insisting on doing whatever he wanted to do instead of what God wanted him to do, God confronted him and said, Cain, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? <clears throat> but if you do not do what is right, Cain's sin is crouching at your door, and you must rule over it, Genesis 4, verse 7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Stop arguing with God. Stop rationalizing with God. Stop kicking against God. Do what is right. Submit to God. You say, but I want, it doesn't make any difference what you want. True worship always has been the man, the woman, submitting to the will of God. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God. Grant me a willing spirit. Yes, that's true worship. Not my will, but yours be done. That's true worship. Whatever you say, Lord, we'll do it your way. Do God's things, but do them with your soul. Don't do them hypocritically. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 3 through 4, God spoke through his prophet Jeremiah to the people of Israel and says, you go out every week and, and you live however you want to and you do whatever you want to and you do all these sins and then you come into my house and you just say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, as if all that can be okay. But an obedient heart is obedient all week. The obedient heart is striving to do the Lord's will all week. An obedient heart comes to God and conforms his will or her will to God. We sing a song, and I know it can be looked at it from a different perspective, but it's always bothered me in this regard. <clears throat> I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. But hold on just a second, Brother Dan. Jesus. Hey, Jesus, come on over here where I am. Come on, Jesus, come on over here where I am and walk with me. Jesus, I'd like to go this way. Come on over here with me, Jesus, and walk with me. No, church. No. Jesus is walking down that path of light. He's not going to come over there and walk with me. I've got to go walk with him. He's always been going like this. Come here, take my hand and walk with me. Come here and grab onto me and follow me. I'm the light of the world, he said. He that follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. True worship is saying, Lord, I'll come to you. I'll take your hand. I'll do what you want me to do humble yourself in the sight of the Lord humble yourself in the sight of the Lord humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And He died for us. And He died for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, that saved a wretch like me. So humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he will lift you up. You know that, that Jed is a great worship leader. He really is. Um, he does make me mad sometimes, though. And I had this picture of a mean old angry man on this slide. And he said, you're not putting that. You're not putting that up there. And, and I, the reason I did it, and I probably shouldn't have had the picture, but here's the reason I did it. I wanted us to think for just a second about God's wrath, about God's anger. Now, I know that 
God is love and God is wonderful and God loves us unending. I get that. But you don't see many times that the Bible teaches that there's a very wrathful side to our God. And I think we take that for granted. And there's a type of our worship that we really can't understand unless we understand the wrath of God. <clears throat> In Romans 3.25, <clears throat> excuse me, Romans 3.25, the Bible says God set forth Jesus on the cross to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Propitiation. What in the world does that mean? That means to appease, an appeasement. What are we trying to appease? We're trying to appease the anger and the wrath of God. I know we don't like to read it, but Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 2 verse 4, after your hardness, or verse 5, after your hardness and impenitent heart, you are storing up for yourselves wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds the wrath of God. Why would our God be angry? Surely he would never be angry at me. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. Surely God could not be angry with me, but I have offended God. I have hurt God. I have offended his holiness and his nature. I have sinned against him. Doesn't God say all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Micah 6, God asks a question. The prophet asks a question, with what shall I come before the Lord? I mean, how am I going to come to God and how can I possibly appease his anger for all the stuff I've done? And I've done some stuff and you've done some stuff. And God's been angry about it. The Hindus... They don't believe in a God that has love. They don't believe in gods that want to redeem men. They don't believe in gods that care about men. They believe in a bunch of angry, mean, hateful gods. And this is a picture of uh, a group of people beside the Ganges River. And they are bringing bowl after bowl after bowl full of vegetables and fruits and meats and flowers. And they're laying those things down in front of their idols day after day thinking, Surely if I do these things, I can, I can make the God not hate me, but be nice to me or feel good toward me. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a part of our worship, which one of these days soon, Dustin and I are going to preach on together. It's our blood worship. It is our atonement worship. And I want you to appreciate what it really is. <clears throat> Imagine yourself in the Old Testament. You're bringing a beautiful lamb that you have uh, uh, nurtured. It's spotless. It's beautiful. Like little Cass one of Cassidy's little goats, you know, it's just perfect. And you're bringing that lamb. And if you have in your mind, which you may not, but I, I do because I remember the steps of the temple in Jerusalem, and I'm bringing that lamb, and I'm holding that lamb in my arms, and I'm walking up those steps, and I know that I have sinned, and I have offended God, and the, the life of this lamb is going to be what enables me to come before God in his anger to be appeased. Imagine yourself at the Lord's Supper, because you see, the only thing that will appease the Lord is the lamb of God. Imagine yourself coming before the Lord, and I want you to think of Jesus. Think of, close your eyes and think of Jesus for a minute, and think of him hanging there on the cross, and John and his mother at the foot of the cross, and they're weeping because of what's happening to him, and he's pale, and he's thin, and he's bloody, and he's beaten, and he's exhausted, and he's weak, 
and they poke his side with that spear and out gushes the blood and the fluid and they realize he's dead. And then they proclaim him dead and they begin to take the bodies down off of the cross. I'm standing there at the foot of the cross and like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, I'm going to come get the body of Jesus. So the body comes down from the cross, the soldiers hand him down and I take his pale, skinny, dead, bloody body in my arms and I go from there and I start walking toward the temple of God and I start up the steps of the temple going up to the temple of God with the body of Christ in my arms and I say to God nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross I cling and I quote Hebrews 10 verse 10 we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And I lay down the body of my Jesus Christ in front of the altar of the Lord. And I say, God, this is my sacrifice to you. And I know because of this that you will accept me and you will cleanse my soul. And I thank you so much, God, for giving this sacrifice for me. Now, that's what I do or a semblance of it at the Lord's Supper. This is my sacrifice. Jesus is my sacrifice. Praise Jesus for what he's done for us. There's blood worship in our worship every Sunday. We come, if we choose to, during that time, before the throne of God with the body of Christ, and we offer it to him again, and we say, Here, God, this is what I bring to you to accept me if his sacrifice is ours. Powerful song. Don't like the title because it's in Latin and nobody understands it. On use day, the Lamb of God. As we offer him to God as our sacrifice today as worshipers, if you don't have the Lamb of God as your sacrifice, you need him. Maybe you need to obey the gospel. Be wonderful if you'd come today. But let's stand and praise him with all of our beings. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Brother Jeff.